don't want to 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 dwell too much on the physical things the ailments things that are happening because it sounds like an excuse and i'm not going to make that um i need to be better i need to fight through and figure out how to make better decisions how to make better throws how to um you know be a better football player uh, and that's why i just said i'm not going to quit i'm going to keep doing that i'm not giving up on this season no one in this building is uh, it's still early and there's still a lot of fight left in us Oh, we haven't talked much about the Pittsburgh Steelers this season. Uh, thought they might be more competitive than this. And uh, we thought that their quarterback would look a little better than he's looked so far. That's Ben Roethlisberger talking about some of the struggles that he's had and the team has had this year. Who better to hang out with, kick it with? Our <laughs> brother, yet another brother pops in. Ahmed, say hello to Jim Trotter. I don't know if you know Jim Trotter, but that's a man to Jim. know. That is the man to know. Oh who taught Kamala Harris everything she knows while they were at <laughs> Howard University uh, together. What's up, Trotter? I, I don't even know how to respond to that, man. <laughs> you know? I, that's all right. It's, it's just truth. So you don't, even have to, you don't even have to respond to it. You don't have to brag. But let me ask she you seriously, uh, She was my classmate, though. I know. I know she was. But well, we how never met. How do you met. feel about... You never met. Not you that you remember. Met. All right. She Not remembers. That I remember. But Damn, you got a good memory. You got a good memory. <laughs> How do you feel about what uh, Ben Roethlisberger was saying there? At, particularly when he talked about he's not going to quit, he's not going to give up on the season. It looks like the Steelers, eh, they may have to punt on this season, but how do you feel about Roethlisberger and the Steelers overall? Yeah, you know, I, I think that's something that he has to say at this point. Um, you never want your starting quarterback to come out and say, I'm quitting on the team or I'm quitting on the season. But let me go in this direction uh, with you, Michael. The Steelers are doing that delicate dance right now where you have a franchise quarterback, future Hall of Famer, who's at the end. And his play doesn't measure up <clears throat> to what we've come to expect. And so you want to be respectful of that player. Um, because there's a, you know, what people, what I was always taught growing up, it's not just what you do, but how you do it. So the Steelers know they're at the end with Ben, and this is going to likely, in all probability, be his final season in Pittsburgh and the NFL. And they want this to end in a positive way, meaning the two sides having a good relationship. Me having covered the Chargers for so many years, I saw so many star players who their relationship with the franchise didn't end well. And those feelings carried over for a number of years. Some, have some of those relationships have never been repaired. My point about Ben, I had someone ask me, should they move on from Ben in terms of should they bench him? And my point was, who are you going to replace him with? You know, we've seen the Mason Rudolph um, dance already. There's nothing pretty about that. And Dwayne Haskins isn't ready at this point, particularly behind an offensive line that's struggling to protect Ben. So from my standpoint, you just got to ride this out as long as you can until Ben just shows you physically he can't get it done. And we do know he's nursing some things before you go ahead and make that change. Yeah, Jim, this one's so interesting to me because it's almost like how are you supposed to do it, right? Because yeah. we've seen the, the Green Bay Packers and how they've kind of approached it and how that's blown up in their face, trying to lay the groundwork, be a year too early or two years too early than a year too late. Um, and so that hasn't totally worked out for them and their team. So I wonder if the Steelers could go back a couple years from now. You say they don't have the answer there right now. I wonder if they could have gone back a couple years from now and started to lay the groundwork uh, behind Big Ben, but I don't know if that would have worked either. Like, what is this an inevitable situation for them that they would have to meet at some point? Well, when we say lay, lay the groundwork, we, um, we would have to go back and look and see who might have been available at that point where they were drafting or if they had chose to make some sort of move to put a backup behind Ben. And one thing I know about Ben, and you guys know this as well, he can be very temperamental. So if they were to put a young quarterback behind him a couple of years ago, two, three years ago, I'm not so sure Ben would have reacted in the right way, um, especially if it's a player that we all would agree at that time, whether we were right or wrong, we wouldn't know. But we would believe that he would be that heir apparent to Ben. So, um, yeah, you always want to look to the future and have a plan. You know, Bill Walsh was one of those people who used to say, it's better to get rid of a player a year early than a year late. Bill Belichick subscribes to that same theory. Um, the Pittsburgh Steelers do it a little differently. Uh, their organization, they have a certain way they go about their business, and at least as it relates to Ben, 
um, knowing that he is one day going to be in Canton. I have a feeling that, that they're going to do everything they can to make sure that this ends on a positive note for him in terms of the relationship. You know, Jim, you talked about uh, uh, a year early, year late, Bill Walsh, Bill Belichick. I'm not sure what Belichick did today with Stephon Gilmore. <laughs> was it a year early? No. Was it a year late? No. Uh, was it great compensation, six-round pick for Stephon Gilmore? No, it wasn't. So just give us some insight there. We know uh, Belichick is not yeah. going to talk about it. He'll just give you some cliches and, and snort at you. Whoa, but whoa, what whoa, happened? Whoa. What happened was... Wait, hang on a minute. Hey. You coming out to the West Coast to ask me about Bill Belichick. There's no greater authority on Bill respect Belichick. That's, this is the respect you. I got for you. The this you. respect. I, I just I know that. No. But but so but thank you. I thank was you. actually coming. But no, I, no, no, wait. Hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. I was actually coming to you to ask you, Michael. <laughs> you know this man better than anyone. Yes. <laughs> Tell me what's going on here. You know what happened? In my opinion, and I just want—I want to get your take on what you've been hearing around league circles. But this is what I think happened. I think the Patriots. This is very rare. They got ragdolled in a negotiation. They—they they felt like they had the hammer. I thought they had the hammer too. Honestly, I'm about, I'll be real. I've been saying it all all uh, off season. Man, Stephon Gilmore, you got played by your agent in this negotiation because he tried to get a new contract while he was hurt. He was hurt for a while, and then when he got well, he didn't want to show his services because he wanted to contract. So I'm saying, hey, man, you're on the other side of 30. You want a new contract, yet you won't show the Patriots or other teams that you're healthy enough to get the contract after missing five games last year. What do you think is going to happen? You're not going to get the money that you're looking for. So I felt like the Patriots really had him in a no-win situation, but then they turn out, they cut him. Then they wind up trading him to the Panthers. Ultimately, he gets out of there. Maybe he does get the contract that he's looking for. But I feel like the Patriots thought they had a lot more leverage than ultimately they had. There's no way they wanted to trade him for a six-round pick. A guy who was Defensive Player of the Year two years ago goes for less compensation than they got for Sony Michelle. I think they botched the negotiation, Trotter. What do you think? Wow. I, I think you laid it out well. Um... I'll say this first, though, about Gilmore. I know that there were at least a couple of teams that I had talked to prior to the start of the season that were closely, closely monitoring that situation and had hopes of bringing him into their place. So when he did get traded during training camp, I thought he's going to be there. For, I thought he's going to be in New England for the year. I'm not sure, Michael, you would know this better than me again. I'm not going to sit here and lie to your viewers and act like I'm in tight with the Patriots. I'm out on the West Coast. I don't spend much time dealing with the Patriots. But I wonder how much the fact that, that there's – how much has their slow start contributed to the move that they made as well? If they were in a position to truly challenge for the AFC East title, would they have made this move? Mm. I'm not so certain that they would have. So I think that plays in. And why should we pay a guy who's mm. not on the field – and we're not in contention right now. So move on. Yeah, I think there's. it's a really weird – I mean, it's a strange transition couple of years for, for New England moving on from Tom Brady. You saw the big splashes they made in free agency, and now you're moving on with a, a new rookie quarterback. And, Jim, that's one of the big storylines for me this year in the NFL. It's a fascinating rookie quarterback class. Just watching each week these players either progress, take a step back, you know, not all of them – you know, many of them in good situations at all with talent around them. Um, but it was interesting to me, the guy that did replace Brady over there in, in New England, during the whole draft process, and you're out on the West Coast, and you saw this firsthand, I was out there for six years, when the rumors came out that it could be Mac Jones is the guy that Kyle Shanahan wanted to trade up and acquire with that number three pick, you saw heads exploding all across the West Coast. Like, why would you trade up? For Mac Jones, you could sit at whatever and get Mac Jones, which in, in retrospect, right. I mean, that's what the Patriots did. And I did think, Jim, and I wonder your take on this, throughout the whole draft process, of course we see the, the great ability that running quarterbacks have um, and what they can bring to a team if they can run and pass. But I almost wondered, I almost felt like I was trying to stick up for, for Mac Jones because I feel like what mm -hmm. we saw on Sunday night was him making accuracy 
sexy again. You know, it's like he, he's a little pudgy. You know, he doesn't have the physique of the other quarterbacks out there. But some of the things that he does with his quick decision, quick release, accuracy, I feel like back, you know, 20 years ago, that was in style. That was Joe Montana. That's what a quarterback needs. And I almost feel like the pendulum swung a little bit too far in our draft analysis process. But hmm. the, your thoughts on, on kind of this rookie class and, and Mac Jones' place in that? Well, the first thing I thought about this rookie class as it relates to quarterbacks was I'm fascinated how every year we act as if this is going to be the greatest rookie class ever. And, and we heard people report, at least I did, I heard people reporting that this quarterback class is the greatest ever. And I'm thinking, did we really forget about 83 already? I mean, <laughs> where we had an Elway, a Marino, a Kelly, you know, go down the list. And I don't know if, it, if it's because now we just expect young players to come in and play well right away. All I know is that with young quarterbacks in particular, many times if they don't play well right away, we say they're a bust. And why do we say that? We put it on the player and ignore the fact of the circumstances they were put into, the coaches that they are surrounded by. For instance, even in Chicago right now where you have a Matt Nagy who was doing nothing to accentuate the talents of, of Justin Fields, and the minute they switch play callers and you have someone who now designs plays and concepts and schemes to fit Justin Fields' abilities, we see him go out and play well last week. So my feeling on this quarterback class was this. San Francisco, here's what I know. Everyone's head exploded when, the, when, when Chris Sims came out and said, Mac Jones, he expected to be the guy. I get that. Um, but all along how the 49ers felt was, we like Mac Jones, but we believe he is the floor. Now let's see what the ceiling is. And when they went out and did their due diligence, they felt that Trey Lance had more upside than Mac Jones because in part of not only his ability to take care of the football, his arm talent, his accuracy, but also the fact of his mobility. Kyle Shanahan has seen in recent years how opponents that he has played, whether it is Russell Wilson, whether it is Kyler Murray, two quarterbacks in the division, that when things break down or plays are extended, those quarterbacks are hell for him and his defense to deal with because of their ability to extend plays uh, with their legs and make it, you know, so that um, San Francisco's defense has a harder time. And that's what the deal was here. So. I'll never forget, after that pick was made, and I talked to a couple of sources in the 49ers organization, they told me that it was Monday morning before the draft when Kyle Shanahan walked into to John Lynch's office, and he said to John, are you ready to take Trey? And John said, and, and I'll, I'll clean it up for your viewers, <laughs> John said, don't mess with me. Are you serious? Huh. And Kyle said, yes. And so on Monday, they knew. The thing was, John and Kyle had never said, this is what we're going to do during the process. They wanted each of them to evaluate independently. They talked about the abilities of these different quarterbacks. And they knew how each one kind of felt, but they never said, this is what I want to do. It wasn't until that Monday morning before the draft when Kyle walked in and said to John, are you ready to do this, that it was in, in, in cement what they were going to do. And, and don't forget this. If they had been able to go out and get Aaron Rodgers or if they had been able to get Deshaun Watson before all of these things happened in Houston and if he were on the market, I do believe they would have made given up those picks to go get one of those two veteran quarterbacks as well. Hey, Jim Trotter, I'll, I'll leave you with this on the way out, man. Uh, I know I still struggle when I see the Chargers and I see the uniforms. I still think San Diego Chargers, and I know people in San Diego must have been looking to Los Angeles and be like, hmm, and they talk about our stadium. They got a dome stadium, and they got a delay, a wait, rain wait. delay no, no, in no. a dome stadium. It, no, bro, come on, let's get it right now. It was not a rain delay. I know. The it NFL, like, as you like, know, I know you're trying to put down my boys out here. The <laughs> NFL has a rule that if lightning is within a certain distance of a venue, then they have to postpone whatever is happening. And so lightning was going off. I mean, look, I live in San Diego. I was up in L.A. for the game. 
I haven't seen lightning like that in Southern California in some time. And it was close enough to the venue that they said, we got to postpone the start of the game, which they did. And by the time that, you know, it had moved on, they started the game. So for all the folks out there, it was not a rain delay and it is not, and they should also know it is not a dome stadium. It is an outdoor stadium with a canopy over the top, translucent canopy over the top. Yeah. Michael's just putting so people it, at risk. Listen, he just wants to put people at risk. Dangerous, dangerous no, thinking. I'm going to say this. In all seriousness, though, in all seriousness, I know it's a great stadium, but that was not that they wanted it to uh, go this way, Trotter, but that is a great run through. That's a great dress rehearsal. The Super Bowl is there, and I'm sure they learned some things that they didn't know after going through that experience because there was a lot of unknowns in that situation. New stadium, and it was a kind of unscripted, hey, what do we do? when things don't go as planned. That's a great, great preview uh, for the Super Bowl, just in case things no, go left. Let me, yeah, let me say this, you're absolutely right, because even at the game, I ran into some officials from the Hall of Fame who were there, and I'm like, what are you doing here? And they're like, we gotta get ready for a trial run for what's gonna happen for the Super Bowl. So you're right, everything that's happening in SoFi this year is all about preparing in part for the Super Bowl and learning what they can now to mitigate any problems they may have that arise in February. Jim Trotter, man, we always uh, we always come away more entertained, more uh, more intelligent after speaking with you, brother. So thank you for popping in, and we hope we can see you again soon. I appreciate you, fellas.